Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Movie High Low, a podcast discussing the best and worst that cinema has to offer. Salutations. That feels like the right thing to say for this podcast. Start it again. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of Movie High Low, a podcast discussing the best and worst that cinema has to offer. I'm Dom. I guess that means you like greetings and salutations. I'm G. <laughs> I'm Dom? Is that a question? <laughs> Are you sure? I'm Dom. <laughs> that sounds like Anchorman, right? What's the line you said? I am Ron Burgundy. <laughs> He put a question mark on the. I love that. It's like one of my. That's still one of the greatest. Huh? I'm I'm going to punch you in the ovaries. Mm mm mm. Scotch, scotch, scotch. Down to my belly. (laughs) Tits McGee. (laughs) Maybe that's who I am. Tits McGee. Not here tonight. I love that movie. So let's let let's let's introduce the film. Let's talk about the movie we're talking about. So today we are talking about Battlefield Earth, directed by Roger Christian. Released on May twelfth, year two thousand. This is a low episode. Um, says who? Who says it's a low episode? Besides just us. Besides us, it's got a two point five rating on IMDb, which makes it the number twenty three lowest movie of all time on IMDb. It's got a meager three percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It won seven Razzies originally, and it's at, at the time of release, it won seven Razzies, so it swept all of the categories that it was nominated in, and then subsequently, years later, it was given two more Razzies, so nine Razzies total. Are the Razzies an actual award show that you go to, or the, it's just... I don't think it's an actual show, and that's the thing, is I don't know... I think that they do hold an event, but I don't... It's not like televised. It's not like the Oscars. It's not like they, they play it on TV. I heard, you know what I heard? I actually heard that Halle Berry showed up when she won for Catwoman and accepted her award. Harazzi? Yeah, I've so I think I think as I think as it's I think as it's gotten more popular, I think people are 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 more. Um, there's there's a sense of humility to show up and be like, yeah, yeah, we know this sucked, because you got to know that. I, I guarantee most of these most of these actors and most of these celebrities, people are that are in these movies to a certain degree, must know that some of it's shit. I mean, they can't imagine that every every bad movie has people behind it that think it's good. I, I think John Travolta thinks this movie is good. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, you so, think he still thinks it's good to this day? I think he probably does. I think, I think, I think he would still defend it. Because, I mean, Maybe that's he's tegrity. not my favorite actor, but he is a good actor, and all the other movies he's been in that I can think of where he does shine, besides the Saturday Night Fever... Is like Pulp Fiction, for instance, or you know, Civil Action. There's other movies that he's really good in, and he has a range and dimension as an actor, and and is believable, and um, you feel for him. And this movie, it's like, I just, I, mean, I guess we'll get into it. I shouldn't talk. About well, no, no, get into it. It's, it's just, I, what is he doing? Who is he trying to be? I mean, the way he's talking, the the acts, not really an accent, but it seems like he's trying to to mimic somebody kind of old fashioned and fancy or with all the big ways that he's doing that yeah, type and of it doesn't seem like an intergalactic you know what was he supposed to be um a cyclo no but there's a name for what he was um commanding field officer or whatever what was his rank he's a, he's a, he's the chief of security right he doesn't let me seem like an intergalactic chief of security he seems like a theater guy that's just being over the top or like it's just odd it doesn't if, if he's taking it seriously he's sure making a joke out of himself in this role let me let me do the synopsis real quick for anybody who uh has not seen the movie does not want to know what's about because i definitely think that the acting um the the actors specifically is is a big is a big part of what we need to get into so for anyone who's not seen the film quick synopsis It's the year 3000 and humankind has become an endangered species after losing the Great War to the Cyclos. Nine foot tall aliens resembling the results of the Predator and a Klingon hitting the crack pipe and spawning a race of love children. Humans, now, humans, I I did write this, of course. Humans, now reduced to a primitive state, 
hide in the mountain caves among their tribes, and those who dare to make their way into the city ruins are often caught and enslaved in order to mine Earth's remaining resources. When our hero, Johnny Goodboy Tyler, it's his fucking name, is captured by Cyclo's chief security officer, Turl, he will have to forge an alliance with his fellow man and lead a resistance to try and retake his home planet. Is that does that about encompass what you I, saw? I think it makes it sound like a better movie than it is. <laughs> it saying, sounds like the kind of movie that John Travolta thinks it is. Maybe I would say the the first. So if we're talking about the highs and the lows of this film, we got to start with the lows because I think there's way more lows than there are highs for this movie. Uh, the first being of which that this is a merciless two hours of of film. Like there's no reason this movie needs to be two hours long for what it is for the fact like if they wanted to spend some time to actually develop the story and develop these characters then maybe two hours is justified but for like the schlocky b sci-fi garbage that it is like this needs to be an hour and a half buck 40 tops well, one of the most tragic things i said is because it's a two-hour movie and barry pepper's character yeah, I guess you feel... I mean, he's the one thing that you're really rooting for in the movie, but a two-hour movie, like, you think you'd be finished with it feeling something or... I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the mission of what it was. the movie was supposed to make you feel. I know it's based off an L. Ron Hubbard novel, the man behind the Scientology religion, but... I know it's not exactly the book that it's based off of, the Scientology religion, but... This is the guy who wrote Dianetics. Right. Same guy. And, that, and that's the book that the religion's based off of, correct? Dianex is the... So, I, I just... I'm not sure what the purpose... What what are, what are what was the audience supposed to take away from that movie? I don't know. And in two hours, it's... it You know, you feel like you should have an answer to that question. Well, the, it's just... The thing is, like, the two hour... It's just a joke. It's just like... Well, the two hour runtime is like... The, the problem is, is the, the plot is so, like, murky and convoluted that... Like when you sit down and watch it, it's I, I I don't usually have a hard time following the plot of a movie, but it's one of those things where like I was having a hard time like following what the fuck was happening in the movie. So yeah, it's strange because I feel like you're having a harder time first watching it than I was, but then you rewatched it. You feel like I did. I actually maybe you're too busy laughing at it to pay attention. To yeah, movie, yeah. I I I, I was following. I mean, it doesn't mean I don't have questions about some of the odd things. I mean, even the opening scene where it's. Barry Pepper with his family and it's his D, father or D, son and whatever D, the first it's it's literally not even it's not even two minutes into the movie it does that it does like it's like a big um it's like a big aerial shot right to show that like they're up in the Rocky Mountains or wherever they are they're they're, they're up in the mountains somewhere and it's this big aerial shot and within like the first two minutes of the movie Barry Pepper like comes back he's on he's he's on horseback he comes back his girlfriend's there, and she's like, I'm sorry, the gods took your father in the night. And he's like, and, he, and it's a slow-mo scream and, like, throwing something into the air. Like, we're... 2001, right? We're like, yeah. Yes, yeah. And that's another thing that's going to come up in this book. Yeah, well, the stuff that they ripped off, the stuff because that they ate. They oh, God. I think of Return of the Jedi. The music, it doesn't sound exactly like it, but it's, it's that quirky, quaint-sounding music that just... The, the set design, the idea of it, I'm like, it's Return of the Jedi, they're trying to be, and then the scene at the end where they're having the whole battle, it's like, oh, God, okay, well, right? like, yeah, no, it's, it, no, it's, it's New Hope, it's Star Wars, it's like, they're aping Star Wars at every friggin' turn, I mean, it's, and the Matrix, too, yeah, the, the, the big thing that, like, you, you see in this movie is, like, the general tone of the movie like what the movie like that was a big low for me because I was just I'm watching it and I'm like all it's doing is it's aping it's clearly a descendant of Star Wars it wants to be Star Wars well, while we're talking about it I don't mean to interrupt you but we should probably also mention that wasn't John Travolta quoted as saying this is better source material than Star Wars I mean really he also said it and was it and this is something that you've said it could have been maybe in the right hands like it's the concept is not what's wrong with the movie the plot right it's it's as you said, murky. I mean, it's not fully realized or compelling or even linear. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's just kind of... I, I keep using the word goofy and I feel like I can't think of anything else. It's just, it's more funny than 
compelling or thought provoking or action packed or um, suspenseful or anything that it might have hoped to have been. It's not, it doesn't live up to any of those things. So it's funny that John Travolta was quoted as saying. He also I read something where he also said it was the Schindler's List of sci-fi movies, and it's like Jesus Christ, dude. And that's the Schindler's List, as we all know. That's just a strange thing to say. I yeah. can get him saying, oh, it's better source material. I mean, not that I agree that it's better source material than Star Wars, but at least Star Wars is a sci-fi movie. So what does... Why would you even lump it in the same category? It's just so bizarre. I don't know. The movie's like trying to be more things. It's trying to be so many different things. And like the biggest problem is... It wants to be kind of gritty and grimy like a Mad Max. You know what I mean? Uh, but it also wants to be epic and polished like a Star Wars. And then it also wants to ape all of the cool, in vogue action style of the Matrix that was very big at that. So it's like it's trying to do all these different things. And because it's trying to spin so many different plates, it's not doing any of them correctly. It's not, yeah. it's not. Or even like the slow mo, one of the slow mo movies uh, you're talking about, right? Like, so, so hold on, so hold on, hold, because that, that's another like. Another low for me is cinematography. The cinematography in this movie, for, I mean, there's no way we can talk about this movie without talking about the fact that every fucking shot in this movie is shot at a Dutch angle, which is when the camera is tilted. Where I come from, we call them crangles, okay? Every fucking shot in this movie is a crangle. And it's not, I'm not exaggerating by saying like, oh, like 50% of it. It's like, no, literally crangle, every... For those who don't know, as in crazy angle. A crazy angle, a Dutch angle is, is the, yeah... So every fucking shot is at a crazy angle. It's at a crangle. So it's one of those things where that that style of shooting is done intentionally. It's supposed to German expressionism. It's supposed to be done to convey that the world is off kilter and like you use it at certain points. But when you do it every single shot, it like drains the entire purpose of having a tilted angle. And then after a while, it, it, it almost feels like the movie is doing everything intentionally to make it unpleasant to watch. And maybe that was the intention, but it, it, especially if it's a two-hour movie where you're supposed to give a shit about anything, it's almost like it's purposely pushing you away to not enjoy it. Roger Ebert, by the way, gave it a half-star review when it came out. This was his opening line in his review. Battlefield Earth is like taking a bus trip with someone who has needed a bath for a long time. It's not merely bad. It's unpleasant in a hostile way. And I'm like, that's that's pretty much the best way I've ever heard it summed up. But the cinematography, like the Dutch angles, the f the transitions, those fucking terrible middle wipes yeah. well, that I was are making the joke that you could make a drinking game out of a couple things in this movie. One of them was the wipes that they happen so frequently that that's how you make that's how you make a good drinking game. It's something that happens often enough that hey, take a sip, take a sip, right? The other thing being John Travolta's goofy look, <laughs> like okay, you sound are you trying to sound? He's trying to sound megalomaniacal and, and devious but it's like you just sound for lack of a better description fruity like just like, like a fruit cake <laughs> ah, like I mean I don't know what would be afraid of you I mean he's not scary I don't know but not to take away from what you were saying I'm no on that no the, the the I think I think if you're gonna make a drinking game for this movie drink every time there's a middle wipe you, you or every time they say man or um, man animal Man animal, rat brain, oh. or leverage. Or, or any time they talk about the planet Earth like it's a cesspit. Like, how many times it's referenced that this place, this place is so awful. You will be fucking dead halfway through this movie. You won't even make it to the halfway right. point of this movie. Because it's like, and that's the thing. Even watching, like, those middle wipes, there's like five of them before you even get into the, it, not even like two minutes into the movie. The only way they dissolve or transition from scene to scene is with those wipes. It's and it's ridiculous. And, and I don't understand. I don't understand why they're doing it because it's like I understand that Star Wars uses those wipes as a way to do transitioning. So they're clearly trying to do like a Star Wars transition. But the fact that it starts at the middle of the frame and and opens like a curtain. They, they probably thought they were reinventing or not. Reinventing, I don't but know. Inventing something. It's, oh, look, we're doing something different. It's but not like Star Wars. But it's our own take on it. Yeah, oh, but you're so but fucking you're stupid. Going left or right, you're going from the middle out. The, the other thing is there's there's so much slow-mo in the movie and this is like this is a technical thing I know I talked to, we, we were talking about it a little bit while we were watching it but it's like 
when when you shoot slow mo, you have to shoot slow motion at a, at a certain frame per second. Usually, like you shoot at like sixty frames per second, or one hundred and twenty frames per second, or like two hundred and forty frames per second, depending on what it is you're trying to capture. And the idea is that if you're watching something in slow motion, it's been shot at a high frame rate. When it's played back in a very fluid, kind of um, uh, seamless way, what ends up in in this movie, at least half of the slow motion is not shot. At, at a high frame rate. So what ends up happening is it has this kind of like jerky kind of like uh, strobed effect. Said, technically when it comes to filmmaking, the thing that was more telling about how it's not intentional. It's like they're, right. they're it's slowing so it down. And, and, Cause that's the kind of thing you need to plan for in your filming. What, what, what parts of this are we trying to slow down versus right. we shot it and now it looks like shit. So we're trying to slow it down in editing. It was yeah. It sucks. And that, and that's like, and, and Again, that might sound like a real technical nitpicky thing, but when you watch it, it just... It, it looks cheesy. It looks really shitty. It makes it look very fucking bad. Well, well and that's why I said it was like that was a wipe, and then it was, um, I think it was after John Travolta was confronting Forrest Whitaker's character for the first time, or, or maybe the second time, or whatever, and it's like, the wipe is happening as Forrest Whitaker's character's kind of turning back with that knowing look like, ha, I got one on you, and you don't even know it, and it's kind of like, and it looked like slow-mo. And, and you're the one that said, no, it's the slow down shutter speed. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then you said, it's like, it's however you worded it, it was like, it's a sign of poor planning that on their part and that if they wanted slow-mo, they couldn't. They should have they shot at the right frame rate. But they weren't planning it that way. They're just in, in post-production trying to find ways to make so it look even, cool. But it actually ends up looking really cheesy. So but. even, even and this is like, and one of my all-time favorite movies ever, ever made, okay, is Reservoir Dogs by Quentin Tarantino. The opening scene of Reservoir Dogs, when you're watching all those guys in slow mo walking by the brick wall, that's not shot at the right frame rate. It's like it's literally slowed down so that it looks kind of jerky. But that's the look, the look of like you're pushing it forward frame by frame by frame instead of seeing something that looks fluid. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the film that shot at the correct frame rate, so it looks fluid. But I don't know that. The, that was something that every time I saw it, it took me out of the movie. I'm like, why does all the slow motion, like, or not all of it, but like at least half of it just, just looks like shit. The corniness of it. Mm. Yeah. I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of this movie. That's how fucking dense the, the shit is in this film. But one of the other lows that I had, that I, that I bucketed out, was too much Turl slash Travolta. Turl is the character that Travolta plays. Um, I feel like, yeah, the character's name's Turl. I feel like that Travolta's obviously the star power behind the movie. He's the guy that got the, he's, he's the biggest star in the movie, especially when it came out. He was definitely the biggest star in the movie at the time. He's the force behind the movie ever getting made. He's a guy, I guess he was trying to make this movie from like the 1980s. Um, right, he was turned down. And, and, and this was a, this was clearly a passion project of his, the fact that it ever got made at all. But the problem, I, for me at least, when I'm watching it, is that as soon as he shows up, it becomes the John Travolta show. That's kind of one of those... Sorry, I don't mean to be David, but that is one of my pet peeves with actor-directors. It's like... Well, he's not the director. Oh, he's, he's not the director. director. He's not even the director. I know, that's true. That's, that's another point to make. It's like, but the idea of like a star an actor that's able to get the movie made because of his star power and then puts himself in the leading role or one of the leading But he's roles. not. He wanted to play Johnny Boy or, J- or Johnny Good Boy, whatever the fuck, uh, Barry, Barry Pepper is. But by the time this movie was able to get made, he was he said he was too old and too fat to play that character. So he cast himself as the villain. So I think he hurt himself by putting himself as the villain is fine if you understand the villain's role in the movie. If the the villain should have taken more of a he he should he should have taken more of a back seat. The the story pulls away from Barry Pepper. If Barry Pepper is supposed to be the hero and we're supposed to follow the hero's journey and we're supposed to give a shit about this character and want to see him unite with fellow mankind and overthrow this this oppressive alien race, right? He, Travolta, when when Travolta shows up in the movie, it's like we spend like twenty minutes with him. It's like we we almost forget there's a fucking Barry Pepper character after a while. If he wanted to be like the Darth Vader of the movie, Darth Vader shows up for like small, like less right. is more. It's like Absolutely. you pop yeah, him in, like that, right? And the ominous score, and you know, it makes it more mysterious and suspenseful, and all of these 
thinks that the movie failed at achieving. I think the movie thought it was smarter than it was because it does this thing with Travolta's character where, and you, we were talking about this before, you were saying like it hum, it's trying to humanize these aliens in a way where like the joke is that Travolta's character, Turl, is he's the chief security of the cyclos on this planet, on planet Earth. And right, the whole reason they're on planet Earth he's, is to drain all the natural resources right. so they can just destroy the planet and leave. But he's, the way he's approaching the character, the way it's presented is like, he's like a middle manager. Like, he's not the boss. He's not Darth Vader. Or he's not the Emperor. He's a middle manager. And he's stuck on an assignment that he doesn't really want. He wants to get the fuck off of Earth as fast as he can. He's like forced to stay even though he doesn't want to stay. They do the whole thing where it's like, you had an affair with the Senator's daughter. And that's why we're keeping you here. Like, there's a vendetta against you type of thing. Right, and I thought that part was so ridiculous too. Because I'm like, uh, okay. Like, it just came out of left field. It was like, oh, how convenient. You could say anything in that moment. Well, you were saying... you. Like, senator you don't see the senator's daughter you don't even you don't know anything and and then and then kelly preston's character comes up later in the movie it's supposed to be like his little girlfriend and she's like does this mean we're not going to get the house now or whatever so it's like you get the impression that that's a little girlfriend but it's like it's just ta- it just feels really tacked on you were saying to me earlier you were saying why do these aliens take on all these human characteristics right. a bar they're drinking and they're talking and they're joking and you know the way they talk and act sometimes is more human than human because the humans in this movie are primitive. They're like cavemen. And that's the whole point. Maybe that's what they were trying to go for. But it didn't fit to me when they act more human than the humans in this movie, but then they constantly say things like, oh, this this awful place, this pitiful excuse for a planet, and this, that, the other thing. It's so horrid and ugly. And uh, can you believe... It's like, then what? Then it's like, why are you drinking fucking drinks that look like hand grenades from New Orleans. Like, what the fuck? Like, at the bottom, like, they have those, like, those, like, big, like, uh, green, like, bong. Right, right. It's like, right. it looks like you're drinking a hand grenade from New Orleans. Like, you're, cl- uh, it doesn't make any sense. The, um, the other thing that, like, as far as contradictions go, and I thought this was kind of funny, too, is there's a whole, one of the only things I thought was kind of interesting, because I always kind of like when, when, uh, sci-fi is supposed to kind of, like, use science fiction as a metaphor for human life as it exists today, like a way to point something at reality from an unrealistic point of view. So there's this one line where, um, and it's like one of the dumbest scenes in the movie, where Travolta takes um, Barry Pepper's character and and some of the other humans out to... um, yeah, and he's and he's shooting all the cows to like kind of show them. He's like, "I am a great marksman. If you ever try to get away from me, like I know how to operate." Translate. If you run, he'll kill you. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, "That's all you said." Yeah, <laughs> that that's kind of a funny line. But then he then he shoots all the cows and he's like blowing all their legs off. And then Barry Pepper's all fucking pissed off, and they like cut away from it. They don't even show it, but he's all pissed off and. He ends up hide. I forget what he does. Like where these other this other race of humans like, like run out. Like another tribe. another tribe shows up, and they they overpower Travolta. And Barry Pepper gets his gun, and he's all pissed off. And he's going, he's going, he's telling the tribe, he's going, put those poor animals out of their misery. Like like do the right thing. And he's yelling at Travolta. And he's like, we only kill animals for food. And Travolta's like, you forget that he's like, he, is the only species that would hunt for sport. For right. Fun. Right, human humans are the only are the only animals that hunt other animals for for sport. I know everything there is to know about you, yet he doesn't know what we eat. He doesn't know that we know we knew how to mine. We were mining the planet for years before you showed. Like, there's all this shit where it's like, does does this character actually know about humans or? The idea is that he's under the the cyclos underestimate humans, or especially Travolta's character underestimates humans to the point of their detriment. Where like right. we'll get the leg up on you and win, right. but it's so inconsistent in how it presents itself. Where are do the cycle do, do do they actually know the history of of humankind, or or is this just total? Is he just an ignorant asshole? It's intentional, or is it on purpose? It doesn't make any. It, it, yeah. it, it it's but so that's inconsistent. Exactly. This movie gave me a lot of those kinds of feelings, particularly with John Travolta. I mean, there. I guess 
there are some kind of goofy things with Jerry Pepper, like the opening scene where he's talking to the shaman or whoever that elder member of his tribe is supposed to be. And he's like, have you ever seen a demon? Have you ever seen a god? And he's like kicking up the dirt and acting all silly. And I'm like, it just, it's like, oh, it takes the seriousness out of the scene. I'm like, if, we're, if it's supposed to be this threat that is posed to these people, if they, if they venture outside of their commune or wherever they are, that they could possibly be hurt or picked up by these quote unquote demons. And then, have you ever seen demons in rule? I mean, I, I don't know. It's just that John Travolta leaves me with more of those feelings. Like, I'm not sure what, is this, is he doing this as a joke or is he actually trying and it's just coming off like a joke because it's that comical? Well, you, know? you, you can't tell if the humor is intentional or unintentional. Or it's just that bad that it's that funny. Yeah. And that's the thing. If, if the humor is intentional. I feeling it's the latter. So, so here's, here's the one thing. Here's the one thing. And this is actually, I'm going to sneak in one of my only like I only have a couple of highs but one of the only other highs that I one of the only highs I have for this movie and this kind of sets it up where they know that Barry Pepper they see that Barry Pepper is at least an exceptional man animal where he's someone who's apparently cunning enough or clever enough to almost get away from a couple of different situations he learns how to fire the gun early they end up teaching him how to um, uh, fly a fucking plane the whole thing's goofy but there's this whole point in the movie that kind of sets up this one joke that I think is really funny where they Barry Pepper almost escapes and John Travolta sees him and he's like, well, why don't we let him and a couple of his friends try to escape into the mountains? Because we don't know. We, we want to get leverage on the humans and w- maybe we can give them a treat. We'll give them something they like to eat and uh, we don't know what they like to eat. So let's let them escape for a couple of days yeah, and see and, and, and see what they like to eat, and then we'll be able to use that as a way to get leverage over them. He keeps talking about getting leverage over people. So there's this whole thing where Barry, they let, intentionally let Barry Pepper and like a couple of his human friends es- think that they're escaping, and they're in the mountains for like three or four days, and John Travolta and, um, the, and um, Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker is too fucking good to be in this movie. There's, there's, there's so many actors in this movie that just are way too good to be involved in this. Um, but anyways, they're watching them escape and they're monitoring on these like little button cameras and they, they get up to the mountains and they're starving to death and they find this fucking rat and they are eating this rat like for sustenance, like just to try and survive. survive. And Travolta is like, Oh, they, they, they love rats. That's what, that's their favorite food. And, 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 and. Forrest Whitaker is like, oh, they're not even cooking it. It's they, they're eating it raw, and he's like, ah, they, makes our job easier. yeah, they like it raw. That's how they like their rats. What the fuck's wrong I know, with you? Said it makes our job easier. And and it sets up the one, the only high, the top high for me in this movie is is maybe, and I don't again, I don't know if this is inten, I don't know, I don't know if it's intentionally funny or if it's unintentionally funny, but it's the one line where after they believe that humans love to eat raw rats. Um, they're zapping Barry Pepper's eyes. They're doing the whole Neo thing where they're they're giving him, I know Kung Fu, they're giving him all the information right. so that he can learn how to fly planes and mm-hmm. do all this shit speak and speak their language and do everything. And understand <laughs> physics and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he just fucking grabs Barry Pepper. Like, he comes, like, the scene comes out of nowhere. He just grabs Barry Pepper by the fucking throat and, <laughs> and holds up a... Ra- <laughs> do you want lunch? <laughs> Do you want lunch? <laughs> Do you want lunch? No, I know. It's and it's <laughs> if they again was John Travolta being serious or was he like if they listen, funny? listen. If 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 they were intending he was for that, to be funny, he they hit the mark. He seriously failed. If they hit them, if if that was supposed to be funny, it was ridiculously funny if they if that's unintentional humor then again it's one of those things where wow guys like holy shit that was like an oasis in the movie when we watched it though too because it was something so that when we got to that part it was just like a welcome i think i rewound it like road. five times I like i just i just kept rewinding because i was like it was one thing that was I entertaining I was there. I was there. um the only other thing i want to bring up real quick with with travolta because i think we've we, we've gone into a lot of this is that um there's this weird thing where his character is, I mean, he's, he's, they, they establish him. He's one of the only, he's still a very one dimensional character in terms of, you know, who the fuck are you supposed to care about? I feel like, you know, as human beings, we care about Barry Pepper, but because he's a human, 
because he's part of our tribe, not because they do anything to develop his character. Right, but I'm saying they they don't they don't actually make him a three dimensional realized human no, to no, care about. No. He's got a girlfriend, and that's it. Like, yeah, that's it. Like, what yeah. what else are we supposed to care? Well, you know, he's just a couple of cavemen. you know. So they don't do a good job of uh, Travolta. They at least spend some time with to show that he's such a one dimensional prick. Um, but really, what the the thing that I thought was really kind of fucked up and interesting about it was is that his character throughout the movie is he's got like these things where he'll he'll like tap a button underneath his desk and it'll like trigger all of these hidden cameras that are in the room and he'll purposefully kind of set situations up where he's recording the person like so he's talking about he has this whole scheme where what he wants to do is he wants to mine um the gold out of the earth so that he can keep it so that he can keep it for himself knowing that it's a commodity and that he's stuck on this planet now for you know the next 50 cycles or whatever it is that they're keeping him there for when they say cycle they mean cycle around the sun so 50 years 50 years probably that that makes sense um so he's got this idea of like well we use the humans for slave labor what if we taught them how to mine and then because the atmosphere is so toxic to the cyclos, the, the they can't come into any contact with radiation, which becomes a huge convoluted plot point later in the movie of how they destroy planet cyclo and how and, and why um, the humans are allowed to mine unsupervised, which to me is fucking ridiculous. With the, like, it's a big stretch. Here's, here's a, here's, here's a, I taught you how to run the plane. Here's the plane. You guys hang out here for two weeks and mine, and we'll be back because we can't be out here and don't get in any trouble. It's like this is really silly. Right. We'll be watching Clearly you. There's going to be a revolution. They're gonna do something. Um, but but the bottom line is that he 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 wants to get them to mine Earth's gold so that he can then take it and have it for himself um, as a way to you know gain leverage over living on being stuck on planet Earth. But the, the point is that he's got this thing where he he can trigger all these cameras and do recording. So he tells his plan to Forrest Whitaker, and then he tells Forrest Whitaker to tell him his plan back to him. What do you think we should, like, what's the plan? And he hits record so that when Forrest Whitaker is telling the plan, it seems like it's Forrest Whitaker's idea. And then he's like, ha-ha, I've got this tape of you now where you're saying that you're going to rip off uh, the home base. And now that I've got... The home office. Now that I've even goofier. goofier. Home office, really? (laughs) You're not human at all, and you're so progressive. It's the year three thousand, and this advanced, super intelligent alien race. It's home office. It's so fucking dumb. But he's got. He's now he's got. He's got leverage on Force Whitaker, and the idea is like now I've got this tape on you, and if you betray me or you don't follow my plans, I will send the tape back. And it's the thing that's fucked up about this is that this seems like, you know, based on like that going clear documentary that they had on HBO about Scientology is like this seems like this is the 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 gig on Scientology is like we got dirt on you and we'll fucking use it against you. So it's interesting that we're thinking that exact same thing, too. That's funny that you saw the same thing. It's just weird that it's it's just weird that it's a plot point in the movie where it's like the characters are scheming against each other to have dirt on each other so that it becomes leverage to keep them loyal. Right. It, it's and a, I, I think that it's interesting because if L. Ron Hubbard, the man behind Scientology as a religion, as a whole, would have written this book, would have written the source material, it seems like he's giving away one of his biggest tricks. Or, I mean, I don't even know if that's something that in the Church of Scientology they were doing, but when we watched that documentary, it seemed like the way in was almost like confessional style, like in, in the Catholic faith, where you confess all your sins in the darkest secrets and we'll accept you. And, you know, whenever Zenu or whatever the god they have and, and their missionaries come down, and you'll be saved because, you know, you confess. Or we, but at the same time, if you try to leave the church, we'll use all of your secrets to blackmail you because. Yeah. We don't want you giving away our secrets or leaving the church. So anyway, my point being, you'd think that that would be something that L. Ron Hubbard would play close to the vest, but at the same time, 
maybe it's because the church of Scientology isn't big yet. Maybe well, he doesn't think people would get that from it. Well, when this movie but came it out... It seemed like an obvious thing. It seemed like an obvious parallel. Here's the thing. Like, most, most of Scientology... The first I ever heard about Scientology in terms of, like, this is what Scientology... Not even... To, no, it was South Park. South Park was, like, the like when they did that episode of South Park on Scientology, that was the first time that I ever was like, oh, this is what... Because Scientology was always kind of like a secret. And the idea was that you didn't learn about Scientology unless you paid admission to get in. So it was always kind of behind closed doors. So when this movie came out in 2000, nobody fucking knew that that was the game. You know what I mean? Nobody knew that that was how it was going. It was one of those things. Well, now now after after South Park, after the Going Clear documentary, after all that stuff has come out. Now it seems more revelatory. Yeah, absolutely. Scary. So let's take a quick let's take a quick break. Let's come back. I want to hear your lows, and then let's come back. Do you want to hear your lows already? I think I've done all my lows. I might have a couple of stray notes, but we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll do the lows and any of the highs that are available. Do you want to know what All right, we're back. Um, I know I feel bad. I kind of, I kind of took over with all of my lows. Well, at least you got them out of the way, so that I can talk about mine. Please, by all means, tell me what are the your lows. The first thing I wrote down was I had to buy on Amazon Prime. What really? <laughs> that was the first low. I couldn't believe that you could not get this movie for free. You know what was what was funny about that though was that the the cost to rent it was like. Four bucks or three bucks, and the cost to buy it was like six bucks. Right. So that's how usually, like when you when you're gonna rent something versus buy something on Amazon, it's like four bucks, ten bucks. That you're the one that always taught me that you vote with your dollar. Don't you feel like you're kind of a sellout or a hypocrite for spending money on this movie? No, I don't feel like a sellout or a hypocrite. That, but, that, but it bothers me because I'm it's so, it's I'm so honey, honey, honey. No, no, no. But we're so beyond the point of. Of it having any effect. You have to understand, the fucking studio that made this movie went bankrupt. Like, me spending six bucks on it in 2020 is not encouraging them to make Battlefield Earth 2. Like, we're not, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know what you're saying. You vote with your doll, you vote with your wallet 100%. Well, but it was, but it was, honestly, it was, it was entertaining for us to be able to do this. I think I wrote down, it's like paying someone to punch you in the face. I think that's what I, I thought originally. <laughs> it's like paying someone to do something, like, right, to, like, just spread their ass cheeks and just put the shit right on your nose. I mean, you know, I, I have to keep going with these analogies. Keep going. You know, it's like paying someone to run over your foot. I mean. No, it's, no you can't shit on your nose and then run over your it's foot. It's like paying someone. It's like paying someone. Well, that was one thing I wrote. I wrote down the cheesy wipe dissolve, which you already talked about. And then I wrote the main character shot in the beginning falls. Okay, yeah, yeah main character being Gary Pepper. So, like, there's a scene in the beginning of the movie when when they first come across the, the Cyclops. They're in a mall or whatever, and Gary Pepper, like, falls. Yeah, he gets shot, and he falls, like, through, like, six panes of glass. I don't know where they came from. I don't know. I know it's a mall, but it was, like, it, w- it was like that sketch that you see, that cliche of, like, you know, the 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 two people carrying a plate of grass, uh, glass mm. across the street in the... <laughs> The clowns with the ten pies and somebody on a tricycle and the woman pushing the baby. It's like cliche. You, I'm like, why is he falling through pain after pain? After like, pain what mall have you ever been to where there's he like 25 fucking... Do you remember that? It was what, oh, yeah. It was in the first you know what's funny? You know what's... Like, why is he just... I get that it's a mall, but it was like a pane of glass, maybe two. But like, it was like one after... It was in succession and I'm just like, he got shot and he's just falling through all these panes of glass. Like... I, I just didn't get it. I'm like, you, you know, you know, what's funny about that. I, I when I was rewatching it, I noticed that there's a couple, there's one, there's at least one of those panes of glass that he falls through that breaks before he even touches it. Like they they trigger right. the fucking right, break exactly. be, before it even touches it. It's so funny. Um, the other thing I wrote, yeah, and we sort of touched upon it was if the planet is so disgusting, then. Why are they so hell bent on mining it? Right, like that's ultimately the biggest reason that this alien race has come to 
dominate this planet is because they want to not to inhabit it, but they want to harvest and mine it and, and get anything they can from it, drain it of its natural resources before exterminating everybody on it and probably blowing up the planet, if I had to guess. But if it's such a piece of shit, then why are they mining it for its resources? Yeah. It's a bit hypocritical in my book. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, I don't know. I guess the... Because, um, I mean, I said it, you can make a drinking game out of every time they make a joke about how shitty the planet, this pitiful excuse for a planet, and I probably should have written down every time they referenced it and how they worded it, but it's like they take a dig at it at least every five to ten minutes. And it's, if it's so horrible, then why are they here mining it for its na- trying to drain all of its natural resources? It doesn't sound like it's so yeah. horrible. If it's such a waste of time or... It's got all this... Why you come here? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. Um, I guess the only... And again, not to play devil's advocate, but I guess the only thing that I could... That I could propose for that is that they're just trying to conquer all of the other... Um, races so like at one point when barry pepper is getting like the the i know kung fu when he's getting all the information they they generate this other weird looking alien that's like hello it's like this little it's like this little pitiful alien it's like hello i'm sorry i'm I'm sorry to bother you but i'm this other alien and i'm probably dead now but i'm going to be your teacher because they conquered my race too. So I guess the only thing you can take from that is that maybe even if the cyclos don't give a shit about what they're mining or if it's very minimal in terms of what what the what the yield is that they're getting, maybe they're just a fucking asshole race of 9-foot douchebags that just Crazy. just want everything in the on the planet because they think they can't be beat. Maybe maybe this movie is actually pretty good. The more the more we talk about it. Well, the other thing I wrote for a low was like how many times John Travolta is going <laughs> oh god like, I mean, just, oh god it's oh my god it's it it's like i think he's just trying really hard to be megalomaniacal like that devious sinister mustache twirling bad guy but in a sci-fi context but like almost like he doesn't realize that if you end every scene laughing it has no effect Especially anymore no! it's not even a cackle it's just obnoxious like he's purposefully going out of his way to be obnoxious right and I believe that was another thing I said you can make a drinking game out of is every time he has one of those stupid laughs um do you have any other lows um I think another one that I had was the gods yeah the god. I mentioned it in, on your end that they have barbershops and bars and you know how they can't stand humans and being on the planet earth but at the same time they seem more human than the humans in the movie do, and they've got things like barbershops and bars and jealousy, and, and you know, I stuff with the senator's daughter and home office, and I mean, the list goes on and on. It's like, but I, I'm I'm getting that maybe that was the point. Is that maybe they were like purposely trying to humanize them? You know, the other thing that was weird about this movie is the way that they try to implement the idea that they speak another language. So there's all this like... Oh, we didn't even talk about any of that. No. Because I I, I couldn't stand that. I mean, when you first see John Travolta's character and all these cyclos, they're all speaking this weird garbled language. We've had this discussion before when it comes to languages in movies. And and I do feel the same way as you. And if we don't always agree on everything, to those who are listening, I don't disagree with everything you said. There's plenty of things we disagree with. We each other we'll s- we'll start right now on some of the shit we don't disagree with, like uh, violence in movies. But let's we'll go there later. What I have a problem with violence in movies. You think that violence in movies causes violence in real life, and I think that violence in movies is a reflection of real life. Unhinged, but that's another discussion. But one area that we do agree is that we prefer to watch a movie in its actual language. If there's a foreign film, you're getting a more authentic performance and a feel for the movie and what's happening when you're watching the actors speaking the language that it was made in. And when you get the subtitles, that's fine. There's people that want to watch it dubbed because they want they just want to hear English. But to me, the dubbing, you're getting completely different performances because you're getting the dubbing of the actor and it just cheapens it to me. So this movie, it didn't do that, but it had the alien language that they were speaking. Okay, I kind of get it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe there'll be... I think, were there subtitles when, when you first... There's no it? subtitles. There's no subtitles no, no. in the entire movie. So you hear them talking to each other, but you don't know exactly what they're saying. And then John Travolta comes outside to meet this first man animal, or not, maybe not the first, but to meet Barry Pepper's character. And all of a sudden, he's able to speak English. And 
and I wasn't sure at first if it was for the audience sake or because he just, I mean, like even there's times he's talking to Forrest Whitaker, it's in English and I'm like, I, now I don't Why aren't they, why aren't they doing it in their native I'd language? I'd rather them just, then they should have so, subtitles so or something. I, I, I agree or, with. Just not have this goofy angling language. The I problem know. is, the problem is if you make a dumb movie like Battlefield Earth, you have to you have to immediately be cynical. You have to immediately think that like this is a dumb movie. So you have to immediately think anyone who's seeing this movie is dumb. So we can't put subtitles in the movie because if we put subtitles in the movie, dumb people don't want to read. Do you think that's a thought process I that filmmakers have absolutely, that? absolutely. So you think they knew it was a stupid movie? <sighs> you don't think it was something they actually thought had a chance to be taken seriously that was made? Let me let, let, let me let me put it let me put it to you this way. Let me put it to you this way. This is, and this is, this is a deviation, but like to make my point, The Crow, right? The movie, The Crow. If you read the source material, the comic book, it's a comic book that's completely drawn in black and white. Now, when they went to make The Crow, I don't think anyone would argue that the original Crow is a great movie. I don't think anyone could make an argument that it's not a great movie because it it is a great movie. And thank God they haven't tried, they've they've tried to remake it like a dozen times now. Thank God they haven't done it because Brandon Lee is fucking phenomenal. Alex Proyas is a, a, a great director, especially in that era, which I want to talk about later. Um, but the point is, is that when they went to make that movie, um, the original intention was to do the movie in black and white. And the producers, the people making the movie, were like, you can't make this in black and white. And it was like, well, why not? The source material is in black and white. There's a thematic idea of why it should be in black and white. And it was like, if you make it in black and white, less people will come and see it. We'll make less money. We won't fucking make our nut, which is what, 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 why, why are we making a movie? We're not making a movie to make art, we're making a movie to make money. So that's why when you watch that movie, they desaturate it as much as they can. They do some, they, 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 it, it's the closest they can get it to black and white because that's the best that they can do. But the point is, is that the movie, the movie gods, as is, wouldn't let them make it in black and white because it would mean less people would go see it. So my point is that if you make Battleship, a Battlefield Earth, if you make this movie with subtitles, whether they think it's a good movie or whether they think it's a shitty movie, they'll they'll think less people will watch it if they have to read subtitles. Now, to your point, it would have made sense for the first half of the movie to be in subtitles. Like if they're trying to ingratiate the audience to feel like, okay, now we understand. Cyclone, cyclo, whatever the language is. Um, if 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 they're trying to make cyclosi, cy, cy, cyclonacini, whatever the fucking language is called, if they're trying to make the audience feel like they're more ingratiated to the language, what would have made sense is the language should have changed over after Barry Pepper got the. Um, I know Kung Fu right. shit. Yeah. Now all of a sudden the main character is hearing them in, in English and now the audience hears them in English. So like if the first half of the movie was in subtitles when they were there and then when Barry Pepper learned the language yeah. and then we learn the language, then it would now make... It to English. So but it's... it leaves the audience feeling a little confused about are they speaking another language? Do they speak English too? And now... John Travolta and Forrest Whitaker, Forrest Whitaker are speaking to each other in English just because they feel like it. Is it not English? Is it because they understand each other that they're speaking in their language, but they're speaking in English? Do you understand? It's again, it's another one of those moments. It's like I don't know what they were trying to do. If it was intentional, if it was an accident, if it was meant to be taken seriously, if it was meant to be something else. I don't think they really knew. All those little things take you out of it, and, and it cheapens the experience. I don't really... Again, and, and this could be a good segue into what the highs are because it's okay. unfortunate that my first high was that it's a good concept. You could do something cool with the idea of what this movie was in, 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 in the right hands, the right director and um, cinematographer, director of photography, uh, DP, right? Director of photography, whatever. Mm. I think the right people on the set to shoot it and the right visionaries behind it that it could have actually probably been something... So are you saying are you saying that one of the highs for you the is concept. the concept? Okay, I think I think the concept when it first starts the first part of the movie, the first line, the first um, what do you call that when they have text in the screen when it says it's the year three thousand and mankind is an endangered species. That what do you call that? When it's on the a screen? title crawl. A title crawl. 
that in and of itself is compelling. Interesting. It's the year 3000 and mankind, humans, are an endangered species. Go on. You know, you want to see more. You want to find out more about that. You could take that and you could have gone somewhere. And they failed in doing that. It was a cheap experience. Whatever money they spent, it wasn't worth it because it wasn't quality. It was like spending a shit ton of money on cheap wine or <laughs> spending a bunch of money on one good bottle of wine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like That's a good way to put it. Spending a bunch of money on all this crap. Just actors that could have been that are great actors that great been actors been best, all of them are right even and directors and even travolta is a great actor director. and 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 here's the thing even travolta is a great actor and even travolta is really good at being a villain i really like him in a lot of villain characters that he plays i total guilty pleasure i like him in pelham one two three i i i think he can i think he's better than the material i think yeah, force whitaker he barry he pepper he obviously can do a villain because of as an example, Pelham one two three. He can do a villain. He's been, even in Pulp Fiction. He's technically kind of. He's a villain. He's, he's totally. He's, the, he's part of the muscle for the villain, but you know he's not always the the hero. Sometimes he's the anti-hero. Yeah, I mean, and I think he likes and it. He can, and he can work in that, but that's that's one way that you know. It's not, I guess, just John Travolta, but I mean, it's it's the fact that John Travolta wanted this movie made so badly and believed in it so much and it could have been something and that it wasn't and it's not his best role as a villain i wonder i wonder if he thinks it is or if it's even up there if it even ranks among one of his best roles as a villain i mean does he actually think that his performance is good in this movie or that the movie was even good who knows what he thinks or what his argument that could be made to say anything different i, don't know. I you know i i would say i think that he probably looked at this as a really for him was probably like, Hey, I can have this really cool departure where this guy was like at the bottom of Hollywood for a long time. Like this guy was making look who's fucking talking movies. You know what I mean? I'm a baby. And like he was doing that kind of garbage for a while. Tarantino resurrected him and brought him back. But it was one of these things where he, he got, a moment in the sun. He got a moment where like he had the power to green light something where he was like, okay, this is a book I read that I really think is cool and it's interesting sci-fi concept. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. I, I, I would not based on this. Sometimes you see a movie where you think that where you're like, Hey, I, you always hear the books better than the movie. Sometimes you'll see a movie and be like, Oh, I want to read the book. I bet maybe it did have a lot of potential and it, it was good. I would say the concept of this of this story could have worked, but I would also say the concept of this the concept of this story has been done before. And in fact, like when I think of like an alien race enslaving humans, I think of Dark City. And I'm like Dark City's a way better version of this movie that's not done in a schlocky garbage sci-fi way. It's an, it's done in like a really Isn't that movie 12 months? Well, 12 Monkeys has nothing to do really with aliens, but t- Dark City is like aliens have suppressed us and have put us in this uh, state where we are just uh, like the whole thing when John Hurt's, oh, when, uh, is it John Hurt who says it? I think they say it to John Hurt's character. Like, do you remember the sun? Not some distant memory, but when's the last time you remember there actually being sun in this place? It's the guy at the beginning of the movie who wakes up and is like, I am awake. I, I know that this is all false and I'm awake. It's it's the Matrix. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Even that terrible scene where like Barry that Pepper before the Matrix though at least. Well, Dark City, that's the big thing about Some the Matrix. The Matrix totally to ripped from Dark City. Right. They use the same Dark sets. Totally ripped from the this is what it is. It becomes Hollywood's this um is this snake eating its own tail. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's it's this it's this thing of like we'll just kind of reshuffle the same shit and regurgitate it, which is kind of what it is. Um, but I would say Dark City is a better version of this same kind of idea, just done in a better way, a more artistic way. The only other thing I wanted to bring up real quick was just like I think it's once they get to Fort Worth and the characters are going to launch this rebellion. I mean, this is the the worst part of the movie is the last act of the movie when they're clearly just doing the same shots 
as Star Wars A New Hope when Luke and, you know, everyone is the the resistance, the rebellion is, is going after um, the Death Star. Like, it's it's the same shot. So it, it, it's well, that, that, plagiarism that on the like worst. The first Strikes Back. Have the wrong movie. Yeah, it's it's the first one. It's when they're it's when they're attacking the Death Star, and it's just it's like some of the most blatant plagiarism. It's some of the worst aping of Star Wars that you'll ever see. Is that last act of this movie? Yeah. Um, but the point the point being, um, the thing that I always think is funny is in in, re- in rewatching this when. The idea is that once the humans break free and they're mining Fort Knox to pretend that they're mining gold, they're like, well, we'll, mi- we'll pretend to mine gold for these assholes, but we'll really just go to this place that we've read about that has all this gold, which apparently, even though Turl knows everything there is to know about humankind, doesn't know Fort Knox is there and even try and go get that gold. So that's fucking stupid. But they go... And they they and steal. There are no shortage of oh, it doesn't make any. None of this movie makes any sense. But they go and they and they, uh, while they're pretending to mine the gold and they're just getting the gold from Fort Knox, they end up going to Fort Hood in Texas, where the military base is. Now, Turl says we destroyed all of your planet and all of their military in nine minutes. We, fo- we your 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 shitty human race. The best thing to put up is- a nine minute fight and we fucking destroy but apparently Fort Hood in Texas none of that shit none of their fucking stuff was destroyed which that's doesn't make any sense they all of these guys all of these cavemen go to Fort Hood and they get in these flight simulators and over the course of seven days learn how to fly military grade fucking planes so that they can launch an attack on 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 these aliens it, it's just that is really I, I i get it doesn't hold up to scrutiny i guess if i guess if the idea is like don't think about it then it's fine but that cavemen go to fort hood jump in these air simulators and learn how to fly military grade airplanes to launch an attack on an alien race is pretty fucking stupid i suppose one can make the argument of like the human adrenaline. spirit well no but just like adrenaline and the need for survival and how survival is a strong instinct and in in survival you have a rush of adrenaline and depending on how pressing the need to survive is or how strong the threat that you're fighting against the adversary is that you would well you know it, so if, if it's like a life or death situation we only have seven days maybe they're motivated i mean I, you I, know it is far-fetched i mean i you know what? Primitive. Like, what do they know about all this technology? You know what's funny? Pepper's character would get it, but why would the rest of them? Right, Although, cause, were they already brainwashed at that point? No, only Barry Pepper was. But it's funny that you say that. It's funny that you say that because there is a scene, and maybe, maybe this movie is secretly brilliant, and maybe we're just realizing it now. But there is a scene where, where Turl is making Barry Pepper go through a flight simulator for the, for the, um, the Cyclos um, uh, aircrafts. And he fucks up. He fucks up. Like he's he's got a collar. He's got like this collar around one of the the girl that he loves. Like they get they end up capturing his right. girlfriend. And they got a collar around his neck. And he's like, I can blow her head up. So when he fucks up the flight simulation, he says to him, he's like, If you fuck up again, I'm gonna blow her head off. And then he doesn't fuck up. And then he says, You see what you know some some leverage does. Right. It's so maybe it's maybe motivation. maybe and, and in survival. Talk about adrenaline and like you know the mother that can lift up a car for a child stuck underneath it. Like when it's seconds count and life or death situations, adrenaline kicks in and you'd be amazed at what people can do when they're under pressure. So I mean, seven days. I, I, I could almost believe it, but the fact that they're these primitive, almost like cavemen characters, like how do they understand this technology? How it works? I get it if it's like look at Happy Barry Pepper because he had all of those programs and stuff in his head now he understands it's advanced physics and all this and that it's like I would believe that maybe he could figure it out but the rest of them just figured it out seven days I mean they didn't know what this kind of technology was it wasn't like it was something they used and they're literally going <laughs> I feel like you and I would be better equipped to figure out how to fight use those planes we played video games. games we have PlayStation know. you know but because we understand how to use this kind of technology a little bit more than they would so it seems even less believable but so this seems like maybe a, it's a more a more of a testament to 
the survival instinct in humankind. So this seems like a good um, segue into any other highs. I know one of the highs you said was um, the concept. Um, one of the highs I said was, do you want lunch? <gasps> do you want lunch? <laughs> well, I like that they, yeah, of course, if you want lunch, it's hilarious. But then I wrote, ha ha, cave is a mall. Like, yeah, I think that was in the beginning where it was like, oh, let's go into this cave. And the fact that the cave was a mall. I like that. Well, the, the, the thing I that... like the symbolism of that or, or the message they were... The thing that they set up that was kind of funny is that when they're walking through the city, they see all these statues and they're going, yeah, the gods, if if you fuck up, they turned you into stone. They turned you into these... these You know, you, you screwed up, so they, they made you um, stand still for life. And then when they go into the mall and they see the mannequins, they're like, oh, they must have really hated these guys. Mm. <laughs> Like, the, like they're stuck in the cave, but they're these little mannequins instead of these big statues outside. So they're like, oh, man, the, the gods really must have hated these guys. Right. That was kind of a funny line. And then I wrote down, um, man animal, ha ha, the gods act more human, which I had talked about. And then I put John Travolta, don't be a knothead, and then he hits his head on the ceiling. I guess he said, Forrest Whitaker, don't be a knothead, and then immediately after. And he said the knothead thing a couple times, I think. But he said, don't be a knothead, and then hits his head on the ceiling. And I guess I found it funny. Yeah. Not to wear it <laughs> Slim pickings. The only other thing I would say as a high, and I and this is again, this is like a reach, I guess, is that I think one of the themes of this movie is that knowledge is power. Is that in order to try to beat the cyclos, Barry Pepper's character realizes like we have to become I'm educated. We have to yeah. we like we're never going to be stronger than them. We're never going to be bigger than them. So we have to become smarter than them. Well, you know, he did acknowledge the importance of food. Like, you know, we're not going to have any strength if we don't eat. And, and he fights that whole guy for the food. Whatever. He's like, from now on, we all eat at the same time. Yeah, so, yeah. He understands that, I guess, so that primitive basic need. I mean, there's basic you take a few. needs. I mean, food, water, and, and, and love. I mean, to know that you're loved and... What's the hierarchy? Isn't there that hierarchy of, like, safety? Water, well, security, right. I mean, security is a big one. I don't know what the hierarchy is. I just know it's, like, the basic needs, like, the physical needs and dietary needs and to survive and all that. And then there's the emotional needs and so. So we, we, sh we should both grade it. Do you, do you find this movie to be high or low? What do you think? It's, I mean, it's low. Clearly. It's a low movie. But... As, as bad as it is, like, let me put, let me put it to you this way. And this is going to be a hot take, and I don't, I don't give a shit who I piss off with this. Um, uh, you know, this movie is definitely derivative and definitely aping Star Wars. But as far as I'm concerned, to be completely fucking honest, uh, you know, I, I, I actually would prefer to watch this movie versus any of the prequels to Star Wars. Like, right. the I mean, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's this huge reverence for for the prequels of Star Wars all of a sudden because people are, are so upset about the sequel trilogy and you know people have forgotten how the ones you like? no the the sequel the, the stuff that just came out this the Kylo Ren's and all that like those the, right. the you like those movies. I think they're okay I think they're there's nothing listen nothing is going to beat the original trilogy nothing is going to beat Empire Strikes Back the the newer stuff that's come out is definitely better than the prequels but because people hate the, the the sequel trilogy, the newer stuff, they all of a sudden are acting like the prequels aren't such garbage. The prequels of Star Wars are some of the worst fucking movies ever made. I mean, they're they're really just up, just upsettingly not good. Like like the dialogue. You'd say you'd rather watch those movies than I'd say it, I'm saying I'd rather watch Battleship, a Battlefield Earth than fucking Phantom Menace. Let's put it that way. Wow. Okay, and I it's honestly, because neither of them are good, but at the very least, I can kind of laugh or at least have some fun with what's going on in this movie. Yeah. Um, that stuff is it's just not boring. Something beautiful that you loved and raping it. No, it's not. I wouldn't say raping it. it. It's not taking something and demoralizing it. You know, the force is. You know, Sorry, when Yoda. Really listen, bad. listen. When Yoda lifts Luke's X-Wing out of the swamp. Okay. And set, and, and Luke can't, and I, I don't believe it. That is why you fail. And when you understand the idea that the force is all around us, it's in us. It's something that we inhabit. It, 
and and you have this feeling of oh my god everything's connected and the and the universe is so much bigger than i can imagine and you get to the fucking phantom menace and you have this wooden you have a great actor like Liam Neeson just giving this wooden garbage performance because it's written so poorly and he's like actually it's midi chlorians in your blood anakin <laughs> whoopee fuck you like i i i i i'd rather watch do you want lunch like a thousand percent you know <laughs> do you want lunch <laughs> Anyways, that's a hot take, but it is what it is. We need to get a coin because we got to flip for uh, what's next. I'll get it. All right, so closing out, we're going to do the coin toss to determine uh, whether we're going high or low for the next episode. As always, please, uh, if you're listening, feel free to write in with your favorite uh, highs or lows. Um, you know, if, if you've got a movie that you'd like to suggest as a high or a low, Send it to us at moviehilo at gmail.com. Spell it all out, M-O-V-I-E-H-I-G-H-L-O-W at gmail.com. Uh, send us your recommendations. Let us know if there's a good film or a bad film we should rev- we should review and why it's good or bad. Right. That makes it a lot more fun for us. Um, all right. So we've already got the highs and lows picked up for next week, but the coin toss will determine whether we're going high or low. So you ready for this? So... No, no, no. We're just going to... Okay. You're almost as good at this as I am. Huh. It's like all this fucking wires. I feel like John Travolta with the fucking snot shit coming out of his fucking nose. Like, all nope. hooked up. Nose hook. Oh, God. Tails again. All right. We're going low again next week, unfortunately. Um, Wicker Man? So next week is going to be 2006 remake of the wicker man starring nick cage um we've we'd never (laughs) we had never we had never seen uh, i don't know (laughs) we you and i had never seen battlefield earth i i i'd never seen this movie cover to cover i'd only seen like parts of it but we've both seen the wicker man um Oh no, no. We're we're gonna have to we're gonna listen, we gotta do it for the people. We're gonna rewatch it and it's gonna be fucking terrible, but um it'll totally be worth it. Yes, but again, please do share the, your suggestions for movies that you'd like to hear us talk about because not only does it make it more fun for us, but it feels like we're doing it for a reason for people that want to hear about it. So Yeah, we're not just working in a vacuum of uh of, of oh, the movies. God. Um well, anyways, this was this was fun. I I enjoyed watching a shitty John Travolta movie with you, sweetie. I enjoy watching other movies with you. Oh, you're my favorite movie person to watch movies with. So, yeah. all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us on Movie Hilo. We will see you next week with 2006 Wicker Man. Gotcha. Flippity flip, hot the beast. Have a good one. Oh, <laughs>